said good morning. I got to tell you, I'm really, really fired up right now for a couple of reasons. I'll tell you why. I say, why, why, why? Three reasons. Number one, I was not here last Sunday, so that gets me extra excited being back in the pulpit. Number two is I already had eight shots of espresso. Don't be judging me. And then number three, you heard uh, last week I drove my son to South Carolina, and uh, so he's, um, he's hanging out with Travis Green. He's his right-hand guy. So that's cool, but uh, Saturday night we went to Elevation Church, just him and I, and that was amazing. And uh, even better was the next morning, so a week ago today, we went to John Gray's church, Relentless Church, and man, I thought we had some energy. Man, we are so white. It's crazy. <laughs> Uh, they were dancing all over the place. It was incredible. So if you kind of sit there all morning, like, it's going to be a really bad service. So it was amazing. My, my son uh, is traveling with him, and they're hanging out. And he said, I, he, I already feel like uh, Travis is my older spiritual brother. And uh, Friday night, he was in uh, the green room with John Gray and Tasha Cobbs, just like four or five of them hanging out. And if you don't know who they are, you're not even saved. So anyhow... Um, <laughs> But we're going to try to get them out here probably in the next year. It would be great to have them here. So he, uh, he's just having a great time, and uh, I am so excited to be back. And uh, I love this church. Yeah. Amen. I love you. I, uh, every time I'm away, as great as those churches were, there's nothing like being home with you, and uh, this is a great place. I love all the different colors we have in our church, different ages, different sizes and shapes, and I mean, oh, this is what heaven's going to be like. If you think Jesus is like 6'2 blonde, <laughs> and heaven's going to be so diverse and so awesome, and uh, I, I love our church, and I love what God's doing in our church. Even through the summer, we have like 3,000 people coming on Sundays, and people are getting baptized, and God's moving in our youth and our kids, and one more time, man, put your hands together. Amen. You may be seated there, ready to study the Bible. How many are ready to study the Bible? All right, as you're turning there, let me just, uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 24. Here's what I know every week, we have people that are brand new, and so if this is your first time, uh, we want to welcome you to our church. It's great to have you here. 20, almost uh, 21 years in, we started with 40 people in a hotel, now we're close to 4,000 people by the grace of God. We're not excited about anything except for Jesus. We're not trying to promote any name, any person. I'm nothing, you're nothing. Jesus is everything, and by God's grace, he just keeps growing us, uh, and we're in four services and growing, and who knows what the next steps are, but they're excited. The best is yet to come. Uh, by the way, next Sunday, next Sunday, um, Anthony Evans will be leading worship in all four of our services, and I was telling the other services, this, this Sunday, coming up, because anytime Anthony leaves, uh, leads, he's still a single guy, and Mui Wapo, a very, very good-looking guy. Uh, this is, we have more single women in this uh, service uh, next week than any other service, because they're like, he's so hot, and uh, anyhow, I'll be leading in all four services. It's going to be great, and uh, so make sure you're here and on time, and uh, God's doing great stuff in our church, our youth. Uh, junior high just got back from camp. High school's up on the mountain, and I've been texting Andrew Paz. He said, man, God is going, uh, doing a powerful thing, and kids are going deep in Jesus and getting saved and set free and all that great stuff, and, and so God's, God's awesome, isn't he? How many love Jesus all, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Amen. All right, title of the message this morning is uh, Don't Cut Corners. Turn to your neighbor and just yell at him, don't cut corners, come on. And turn to the person on your other, uh, your other side, the person you don't like as much as the first choice. Tell them, don't cut corners, come on. Let's all say it together at the count of three, one, two, three. Don't, don't cut corners. And because there are people here for the very first time, I want to get you up to speed on where we've been about five or six weeks ago. We started a series on the life of David. We're studying a Bible Character. Let me, let, me, let me say this. As we're studying a Bible character, we're not just studying a Bible character to study a Bible character. We're studying a Bible character because we want the character of God developed inside of us. Yeah. Amen. God bless four or five of you in this section. All of you are still sleeping, and I did get one amen over here. So thank you, Joe. We want God to develop his character in us, and I don't know about you, but I want to be further in uh, uh, along in my relationship with Jesus next year than I was last year, a month ago than I am today. Can I get an amen in the house? So we, we're not just here because it's a cool thing to study David. We want the character of Jesus con uh, formed in our life. Amen? Amen. 
So uh, we started about five weeks ago. We've had a couple of breaks in between, but uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, God uh, chose a king, his name was David, uh, out of uh, eight brothers. Uh, they brought the brothers one by one. You remember if you were here a couple of weeks ago, 1, Kings chapter, or 1 Samuel 16, and uh, he brought the first seven brothers, and, and God said, do you, do you have another one, Justin? He goes, I got one more, but he's in the sheep pen. He's the youngest one. He's kind of ordinary, and God's like, that's the one I'm placing my hand upon, and, and God anointed him king. Uh, but how many know sometimes when God gives you an assignment or a position or an anointing, uh, it doesn't happen like the same day. So many years after he was ordained, uh, anointed king, uh, we're going to see that uh, the fruition of that doesn't come for many years later. But that, that was 1 Kings chapter 16 and 1 uh, Samuel 17. Uh, David took down this big Goliath guy. He was a giant killer. And uh, so Saul, who was the king at the time, gets a little jealous of David because now David has this fan club. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 18, what happens after he kills the giant? The Bible says there were thousands of people on the streets and they were singing a song. Do you know the song they were singing? You don't? Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, it was found in 1 Samuel 18. The song that the ladies were singing was that Saul kills his thousands, but David kills his tens of thousands. And so they went nuts because uh, David the king killed more than Saul at the time. And so uh, how many know Saul's going to get ticked off about that? So in 1 Samuel 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23, we see the first king, Saul, chasing David. And the reason why he's chasing David is he wants to take David out because he is a threat and he's jealous of all of the accolades that uh, David is getting. So we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 24. If you have your Bible before we start reading, would you go ahead and hold your Bible up in the air? I just want to remind us that I don't have a whole lot to say, but people in this church are fired up about this book. Keep your Bible up. Simon says, keep your Bible in the air. How many are grateful for the Word of God? Yeah. And, and I want, uh, Simon didn't say put it down yet. Um, I know you're getting tired. Your Bible looks pretty thick there, but uh, keep it up in the air. And uh, okay, Simon says, put it down. But we're just excited about this book because I have nothing to say. Uh, we're not into the Sports Illustrated or Cosmopolitan or Reader's Digest. We're just excited about one book, the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Written on three different continents, three different uh, 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 Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. 40 different authors. There's two testaments, the old and the new. And I mean, there's no contradictions in the Bible. People are like, there's so many contradictions. I'm always like, show me one. And they're like, uh, 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 uh. How many know that the Bible does not contradict himself because God doesn't contradict himself? And how we know that this is a sure book is because although it was written by human people, the Bible says it was the Holy Spirit that breathed into the person exactly what to say. If God can create all that you and I see, the heavens and the earth and the mountains and the oceans in a couple days, how many know that he can guarantee that his word is uh penned with accuracy. So I don't know, we are excited about this book and uh, do you know that this is a rare thing to see in the church today? I don't need those, I already know my outline, okay? This is really rare to see in the church, people bringing their Bibles to church, opening up the Bible, reading the Bible, and most importantly, here it is, applying the Bible. That's why we came to church, not just for me to speak to you, we came to hear what God wants to say, walk out of the building, totally different. Turn to somebody and just say, totally different. But do it like that. Yeah, totally different. Okay. So 1 Samuel chapter um, 24. Do you have your Bible there? 1 Samuel chapter 24. And uh, you ready to read? So the Bible says in verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, just say, go, 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 go. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took, how many? 3,000 young, able men to do what? To take David out. To gather 3,000 men, uh, uh, able young men from all Israel, and set out to look for David to kill him and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Okay? So here's what I want to do. I just want to give you three simple principles in your notes there. Uh, if you want to cheat and, and get the answers, you can run up here and grab my copy right there. But uh, no, no. Act surprise. So here we go. I want to talk about three things, and I want to pull out these principles out of 1 Samuel chapter 24 about not cutting corners. Anybody interested? I want you to see this. I, I was just blown away in the text. Verses 1 through 3 uh, talk about, write this down, number one, they talk about an unusual situation. Someone say unusual. unusual. It was very, it was very what? Un, very unusual and uh, very unusual. And so I said earlier that God anointed and appointed David to be the next king, but David had to wait 
for his assignment. Look at me. How many believe that God has a call upon your life? I'm not saying, thank you. I'm not saying, thank you. I'm not saying uh, that God's calling you to be a senior pastor at a church, right? But how many believe everybody in the room has a call upon your life? I, I'll, I'll prove this. First Peter 4.10 says, each one of us, raise your hand if you're in each one. Okay, each one of us has received a gift from God. It says, therefore, minister it to one another. Okay, I'll go ahead and pick this up. Uh, minister it. So God's given us all a gift, a personality, a style. He wants us to use our gift to minister it to one another. And everybody in the room, you have a calling from God. I'll prove it. How many of you, I just want to ask this question. I haven't done it in a while. How many of you are full-time ministers of the gospel? Let me raise, okay. Uh, these are the full-time people. Raise your hand. Keep it up and then look around because we have some that have their hand up and some that don't. Now, I'm such a nice teacher, I'm going to give you the answer and then I'll ask you the question is. Ready for the answer? The answer is everybody in the room is a full-time minister. So let me ask you the question. How many full-time ministers do we have in the building right here? Okay. You don't have your hand up there. Raise your hand. Okay. So I got to say it one more time. So some of you are not convinced. Everybody in the room is a full-time minister of the gospel. You might serve, like, we don't, how many want to go to heaven part-time? Not me. I, I'm full-time, right? I'm a full-time. I'm a mailman, but I'm still a full-time minister. I work at a bank, but I'm still a full-time minister. I, I'm a teacher, but no, I'm a full-time minister. God dresses us up like a police officer, like a fireman, like a nurse, but that's not my first calling. I'm a full-time minister, right? Because I'm serving Jesus 100%. I don't want to go to heaven part-time, full-time. So how many are full-time? Amen. God's called you, God's anointed you, God's appointed you. Your calling's different from mine, but you have a calling on your life. How many would admit sometimes my calling doesn't match my circumstances? I knew that God called me, but here I am as 20-something-year-old kid at an old folks home in Pasadena preaching the gospel to eight people that are falling asleep. And sometimes your calling doesn't match your circumstances, so what do you do? You stay patient because God knows exactly what he's doing. So God called David to be the next king, but he has to wait many, many years. And I promise you, everybody in the room, because you have a gifting, because you have a style, because you have a calling, I guarantee you the enemy will come against that calling. He'll try to speak to your mind and say, you're really not called. People will rise up and say, God can't use you. I promise you, there's gonna be some adversity. There's gonna be some pushback. There will be some resistance. I promise you, because we're called doesn't mean that there's not gonna be any problems and obstacles. But I want you to see in the text how unusual this situation is. So in verse two, the Bible, or three, it says, he came, David came to the, how many know every word's really important in the Bible? He came to the, I want, you to, I want you to look at that. He came to the sheep pens, which triggered, in my office this week, I was thinking about the sheep pens because I started thinking about uh, Psalm 78, verse 70, that says this. Look up, look up on the screen. Psalm 78, 70 says, he chose David, his servant, and took him from the, so he, listen, he started at the sheep pen, and then in 1 Samuel 24, it says that David's back at the sheep pen. Notice that God called him out of the sheep pens as a key word, as a what? Servant. You ever want to get up on the platform? You ever want to be used powerfully by God? It doesn't start here. It doesn't start here. It starts in the children's ministry. It starts serving as an usher, second Saturday, giving your life away. I said a couple weeks ago, excellence and competence paves the way to influence. True? I also want to add serving people paves the way to influence. You want God to use you in a powerful way, in any way? I'm telling you, it begins with servant. Jesus said, you want to be great in the kingdom of God, let him be the servant of all. It's interesting that God called David out of the sheep pens. Question, what was he doing in the sheep pens? I'll tell you, taking care of sheep and the mess they make. He didn't call him as an apostle right away or a prophet. He called him as a servant. And if you want influence in people's life, learn to serve them and God will open doors. And I, I love this about David. He didn't rush his way up to the kingship. It was a process. Check this out. I want to talk to anybody in the building that's younger, that wants to be used by God in a powerful way. Is there anybody in here that's younger that wants to be used by God in a powerful way? Let me tell you. Some of you are like 60 and raise your hand. That's awesome. I'm glad you see yourself. No, that's good. That's good. Okay. But listen, you have to learn how to serve and you have to understand that God knows exactly when to position you, to give you a platform, to give you influence, to, to give you more of a voice 
God, God's timing is perfect 100% of the time. Oftentimes, we want to rush it. We want to rush it. We want to be up here. And I'm telling you, if you don't have your character developed, your gift will take you further than your character will be able to sustain you. Because if you got up here after you got saved for a year, that's why we don't just let anybody come up on the stage that just got saved three months ago because God's still forming you. You're still growing up, right? Because, I mean, no, the God's, God's timing is perfect. The, the Bible says a righteous man's steps are ordered of the Lord. But a lot of young people want to go from the bottom floor to, to floor 15 in two weeks. No, God's ordering your steps. Just be patient like David. Stay in the sheep pen. Keep serving. God's going to use you in a powerful way. Just don't push down the door. Can I get an amen? amen. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Be the servant of all. So check it out. Verse 3. He came near the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. I'm a super uh, visual guy, so when I was reading this week in my office about a cave, I just thought like it was a little hole in the side of a mountain where like three people can, is that, is that the idea you have like three or four people can, no, the, here's the cave at En Gedi right here, it's actual picture, and if you were to go through the cave, you can go on the back side of the cave, there's actually, I could show you other pictures, there's waterfalls, there's little ponds there, so this isn't like three people can fit inside. This is like hundreds of people can fit inside, and I can prove it to you by 1 Samuel 23, verse 13 says, David is inside of the cave, and he's got 600 of his soldiers with him. So this, uh, big cave or small cave? Go ahead and vote. Uh, big cave, big. And so you got the picture there? Here's the unusual situation. David is there, 600 of his soldiers, and now King Saul walks into the cave to do what? Verse 3, and Saul went into the cave to... Look at your Bible. What does it say? And to, to do what? Relieve himself. So when the Bible says he went in to relieve himself, here's what it means. He went in to relieve himself. <laughs> El baño. He was in. This is why I love the Bible. You cannot make this up. Like who in the world would put the king of Israel in a cave squatting down going to the bathroom? And this is the unusual situation. That's why I love the Bible. So there you got the king of, of Israel squatting in the cave. And there's so many things I want to say about that, but I better not because my wife is near. And she'll grab me after the service and say, don't ever say that again. So I'll just stop right there. Steve, don't say it. Steve, shut up. Don't say anything. So he's in the cave. He's bending down and he's going to relieve himself. And I mean, oh, that's a very unusual situation. Which brings me to my second point of a unique temptation. Write it down. Number two, a unique temptation. Someone say unique. Someone say temptation. Here's the temptation. It comes in verses uh, 4 through 7. You got your Bible there? A, un a unusual situation, a unique temptation. Verse 4 says, the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you. So David's soldiers are telling him, this is the day. The Lord spoke of you when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with him as you wish. I want you to see it in the New Living Translation. Look up here on the screen. His, friend, his soldiers say, David, now's your opportunity. Let's all say that. Go. Now say it out loud like you're awake and you already had your frappuccino. One, two, three, go. Now, now so his soldiers saying, David, now is your opportunity. And then they, he go, they go on to say, today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David, so we'll get back to that. So they're, they're like, David, this is God. The, the enemy has been chasing you. We were in a cave kind of hiding out from being chased and God brings in the, uh, the king right there and all you got to do is take him out. Now is the opportunity. Interesting. Can I just tell you not every opportunity is a God-ordained opportunity? Not every open door in your life is a door that God has opened. I've been doing this a long time, almost 30 years I've been a pastor. Crazy things I hear about, God told me to do this. God told me to do that. God told me to do this. God told me to do that. Not true. Not true. Someone say not true. Not, listen, people say the crazy, I got a vision last night and the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and said I'm supposed to divorce my wife. And I'm like, why? Because we're just not getting along anymore. I'm like, that's not true. Let me just tell you, if anything that you get a vision, a word from somebody, somebody tells you that contradicts what God's already said in his word, let me say it again. God will never tell you to do something that he's already told you or not to tell you in this book. You're like, I don't know, I was about in the middle of the night and I knew it was God. No, too much pepperoni on your pizza. You had manu though, that was not God. 
I'm just telling you the craziest things I've heard. And they, people, like how people decipher the will of God. I, here's my boyfriend. We've been, he's, so, he's so, I'm like, is he a Christian? Well, I, I just know it was God. How? Well, it's really weird, Pastor Steve. I was born on June 10th, and, and she was born on, on September 10th. And it's got to be God, number 10. With both of us on 10. I'm like, no, you're dumb. But I don't say that. I think that. I just feel like God's calling us to move. Why? Where? Just because. How come? Because. Why? Because I want to. How do you know it's God? It's just weird. We just started thinking about maybe moving to the desert. I, it dawned on me. I was born in Knoxville. She was born in Nashville. And God's saying we need to move to Victorville. <laughs> or Danville. Or Roseville. I don't know. It's just God. Something about Ville, Pastor Steve. I'm like, no, you're dumb too. Okay? Like, no, he doesn't do that. I, don't, I met the, the woman of my dreams. How do you know it's God? This is crazy, Pastor Steve. My parents met on the 7th of June. His parents met on the 10th of June. We met on the 17th. 7 plus 10 equals 17. What are you talking about? You're weird. And his soldiers are saying, now is your opportunity. Could it be that every open door in your life is not necessarily an open door from God? Could it be that the enemy has been setting that up for you to open up a door that isn't God? I don't know about you, check this out. I don't want a job that God doesn't want me to have. I don't want friends God doesn't want me to have. I don't want to get married. I'm, I'm speaking hypothetically, I'm already married. I wouldn't want to marry anybody that God doesn't want me to marry. I don't want friends that God doesn't want me to have. I don't want to have a job. I don't want to move anywhere unless God is saying, I want you to do this. How do you know? Does it line up with the word of God, number one? Number two, what are other godly people saying? The Bible says there is safety in the multitude of counselors, but godly counselors. Key word. I'm getting married. Who? I just met this guy at the bar. He's so hot. Is he a Christian? He believes in God. Awesome. So you're telling me he's a demon. What? Yeah, because the Bible says even the demons in hell believe there's a God. So you're, you're, you're marrying a demon. Who, who said it was okay? Well, I talked to my uncle. He's kind of an alcoholic and stuff, but he's pretty smart. No, what, what did four or five other godly people, four or five pastors or elders, did you bounce it? What did they say about it? Well, all of them said I shouldn't marry them. Duh. Duh. All of God's people said, then you probably should. Isn't it amazing? We can, we, can make, we, we can throw the God card on anything to, make, to get our way. True or false? So his soldiers say, hey, David, now is the opportunity, man. You can take this guy out. You can establish your kingdom. You can have more power. You can have more influence. This is your day, David. And notice it goes on to say, to, now is your opportunity. Hey, God's been saying this all along. I studied this out. You know, God never says, said that one thing to David ever. He never said, take out Saul and you got the kingdom. He never said that not one time. They made the whole thing up. And we can make God say anything that we want God to say to get our own way. This is such a unique uh, situation. So notice in the end of verse 4. He says, I will give your enemy into your hands. Notice, uh, then David crept up unnoticed and, this is great. So you see David, he's going to the bathroom right here. All of his soldiers are outside of the cave. David's got his soldiers here. And the Bible says, look, look up here, you got to see it. I'm a, so he, he, he crept up unnoticed. So Saul's doing his thing facing that way. David comes up behind him. And the Bible says he came unnoticed and he... He cut a corner of his robe. No, he didn't kill him, but he cut a corner. Now notice, this is really interesting. He didn't kill him, but he... So the title of the message is, Don't Cut Corners. He could have justified it and said, Well, I didn't kill him, but I cut a corner. You know, there are people in the room right now I've never hit my wife, but I verbally abuse her. I, I, don't, I didn't kill her, but I cut a corner. I don't lie, but I cheat. I don't steal, but I go off on of my kids. I got a really bad temper. So I don't kill. I mean, we can justify our sin. I don't kill. I don't do that. I haven't slept all the way. I mean, we actually haven't had sex or intercourse, but you've done everything else but that. Isn't it interesting in our life, we could justify our own sin, justify our own actions to look better than we really are. 
So his soldiers are saying, take him out. Today's your day. Now's the opportunity. And he didn't kill him, but he cut a corner. And you're like, what's the big deal about cutting the king's corner? The verse 5 says, after he did that, the Bible says that David's conscience was stricken. Let me just ask you a question. The further you get in your relationship with Jesus Christ, this should be true of our lives. This, I hope this is true of my life. The further I get along, I'm going to get closer to Jesus. It's easy to justify because I could look at some of you and go, I'm not as bad as they are. That's, you're not my standard. Jesus is my standard. And we can say, well, I don't do this, but, but you do that. And I, I want every area, of my, every area of my life, and I'm not perfect, and you know that. But the Bible says examine yourself to see where you're at the faith. It's a, it's a, my daughters are talking to me about the numbers of people in our church who just flat out cuss. They don't even think there's a problem with it. How about just, I'll give you one verse, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. They're just like, and not only people in our church, but like I know pastors that cuss. I'm like, are you kidding me? And we go to the same bars they go. We go to the same parties they do. We sleep, with, sleep around just like other people do. I don't know, the last time I checked, God is my standard. He's coming back for a holy bride without spot or blemish. As long as I'm the pastor of this church, we're going to contend for holiness and Christ-likeness. And if it means, listen, if it means we only have 15 people in the church and we're down to one service, so be it. We're not trying to build a bunch of people that are mediocre, me mediocre in their faith. In fact, I'll talk more about this next week. We're not compromising. We're going after Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So I love that about David. I think one of the reasons why he's a man after God's own heart was he was upset about a little thing that didn't seem big at all. He didn't kill the king, I know, but you cut a corner. And so the Bible says in verse five that his conscience was stricken. Let me ask you a question. Do you cut corners at work? So you got to clock in at a certain time, 8.30 in the morning, but you have a friend clock you in because you're running 20 minutes late like every day. You take longer breaks and longer lunches than you should, and then you bail early, and you kind of give 80%, 60%, 50%. You're on the Internet going to certain sites, goofing around, talking to your friends. Then they're paying you for eight hours. Yeah, they got so much money, they don't need it. I know, but you're cutting a corner. God will never advance you. God will never promote you. God will never give you a platform when you cut corners. Are you cutting corners in your relationships with your friends? Are you cutting corners at church with your finances? David said, man, I, I'm a different king. I'm a different leader. I'm a different Christian. You guys might think it's the opportunity to take out the king. Not only am I not taking out the king, I'm, I'm guilty that I cut a corner. So verse 5 says, afterward, David was conscience stricken for cutting a corner of his robe. Verse 6 says, he said this to the men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is anointed of the Lord. I'm not going to do it. I'm a different kind of leader. I'm a different kind of Christian. I'm a different kind of king. I'm a man after God's own heart. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. I'm not cutting corners. Number three, write this third thing down, an uncommon reaction. An uncommon reaction. Let me ask you a question. If you were in the cave and the guy that was coming to kill you was about to kill you, looking for you, and you had the opportunity to take him out, I just got to be honest with my, I'd probably take him out. I'd probably cut off his head, right? And this is why it's uncommon. Check it out in verse 8. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my lord, the king. Can you see? So David goes to the, or Saul goes to the bathroom and leaves the cave. David cuts off the corner. Then he goes outside of the cave. Look this way. He's like, Saul. And he's kind of holding up the corner of his robe. And he says in verse 8, then David went out of the cave and called to Saul. Notice what he calls him, by the way. My lord, what? When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down. Humility, respect, honor, and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say, David has been on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay hands on my, on my keyword, Lord, respect, honor, because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not 
touch you. This is an uncommon reaction. In our culture, somebody wants to give you a piece of their mind, you give them a piece of your mind. Somebody cuts you off on the freeway and flips you off, you cut them off and you flip them off. Hey, it's all about revenge. It's all about retaliation. Hey, they don't forgive you, you don't forgive them. Forget them. And David's like, I'm not that kind of leader. I'm not that kind of king. So he calls him Lord. He bows down and he gets on his face prostrate. That is respect and honor. Here's the uncommon reaction. The uncommon reaction is instead of killing him, he honored him. I want everybody to look at me. I want us to, I, I want to ask the question, where is the honor anymore in our culture? It's popular today to dishonor politicians. You might not like it. You might not agree with their stances. Last time I checked, I read my Bible in Romans chapter 13. The Bible says, honor and respect those in authority. Yeah, I don't like them. Doesn't matter. Respect. If you can't respect the person, respect the position. Where's the honor at? So I was telling the other service, I, I remember when I was a little boy, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever, junior high, and I was walking on the sidewalk with my friends, and on the, the other direction, you have an older couple, senior citizens, and what we would do, out of respect for those that were older, we would get off of the sidewalk and let the older people go by. What, what's happened in our culture? Now it's like all the young kids, like, what's up, man? And then we, we're making senior citizens walk on the street. We need to bring the honor back. It's popular in our culture to dishonor people. And the uncommon reaction is, hey, instead of taking people out, giving people a piece of your mind, we need to bring the honor back. And as long as I'm the pastor of this church, we will continue to honor people. People that we don't like, people that we, don't dis that we disagree with, we honor everybody at our church. We're going to keep creating and maintaining a culture of, tell me, honor. So when a brand new person comes to our church, they don't understand everything, we're going to honor that person. We're going to honor our volunteers. Hey, right after the service, in fact, not only this service, every service, if you have kids, you should be telling all of those teachers that are 99.9% .9 volunteers, thank you so much for watching my kid. Because you don't know this, but your kid was a little booger in class for 90 minutes. And you're in here going, oh, hallelujah. And they're there going, oh, look at, right? Honor our teachers. Honor our ushers when they ask you, hey, is there any way you can move forward or squish in? I'm just blown away. I said this like that. People are crazy. You don't tell me where to move. Where is, where is Jesus in that? You don't tell me where to move. People in our church, usher, hey, is there any way you can maybe move? No, I'm not doing that. People sneaking in food and drink. Just, hey, could, is there any way you could? No, I'm not doing it. You don't tell me. What, where is Jesus in that? Where's the honor? I don't like that policy. Doesn't matter. Let's honor our volunteers, our ushers. Let's honor those in leadership, people that we disagree with. Let's bring the honor back. Wives. Look, where's all the married ladies at? I think we need to bring the honor back. I think I, some husbands do, but I think husbands need to get back at opening car doors and restaurant doors for wives. Can I get a high-pitched amen in the house? And men, I think, I, I think we deserve honor. I know there's not one husband in the room that likes when our spouse berates us. One of the reasons why I chose my wife, because not only is she like a hot Christian Baywatch babe, but <laughs> I, I watched the way she honored her father, and I knew that she would honor me that way. And we need wives that will honor their husbands. You're like, ah, oh, he's such a lazy bum. It's okay. If you can't honor the person, honor the position. We need kids. Kids. I was at the restaurant the other day. The lady's like, Johnny, get over here. And he's like, Why? Then he, she, she said it again, he said, what? What? I was about to go karate kid on that kid. I was just like, oh. Are you kidding me? You don't, if, if I ever gave my dad a what growing up? What? Get over it, what? I'll give you what. And parents, before you say amen, I think probably the reason why your kids don't honor people is because you haven't taught them that. Sorry for the sucker punch. <laughs> Welcome back, Pastor Steve. <laughs> it's got to bring the honor back. Amen. How many want God to do miracles in your life? Yes. Good, seven people, that's great, awesome. <laughs> Here, here's how this went down. How many want God to do miracles? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, check out this verse. 
Matthew chapter 13, 57 through 58. The Bible says, then Jesus told them a prophet is honored everywhere except his own hometown and among his own family. So he did only a few miracles there. Why? Because they didn't honor him. Notice, in his own hometown. Check this out. Isn't it true? And it shouldn't be, but it's true. The people that we have a tendency to dishonor, the people closest to us, our family, people at church, people that we work with, our friends. And Jesus said, hey, I go everywhere and I'm getting honored, but I go to my own hometown and nobody honors me. Because of that, I can't do a lot of miracles there. You want God to open up? a lid off and do miracles in your life and your marriage and your kids, you start honoring people that you don't like, you don't agree with, you don't see the same, not eye to eye, they have a different policy, they're Republican, they're Democrat, they're liberal, they're whatever. Honor the person. Here's what I've discovered about honor. It's not deserved necessarily, it's decided. Your boss, honestly, your boss is kind of a jerk. But you just got to decide today, I'm going to go tomorrow and I'm going to honor my boss. I, she is so mean. I know. Honor her and I guarantee you that your workplace might change. You want God to do miracles in your life? Start honoring the people around you. Check it out. You honor people, God will honor you. God will promote you. Honor, honor, honor. We're going after a culture of honor here at New Life Community Church. We are going to honor one another. Check this out. We're also going to honor God. Most importantly, how do we do that? Well, service starts at 11 o'clock. And I'm not talking to anybody this morning. I'm just saying, I, like if, if I told you next week, Jesus is going to be in the third service at 11. How many are rolling in at 1120? It's like, oh, I'll talk to him. When he, no, you're going to get there early. Let's try to get here early. And people on our staff are like, it doesn't matter what you say. This is just the culture. I'm fighting against the culture. Be on time, be prayed up, bring your Bible, be engaged. When the worship team starts, they're, they're not performing for you. This is not a spectator. This isn't a Dodger game. All of us are worshipers. So when you come, give God 100% of your time, affection, and your devotion. Bring back the honor. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to honor those in my family. I'm honoring people at my church, people I disagree with, politicians. In fact, I want to do this right now. Would you stand to your feet if you're a police officer, fireman, you're in the military, you served in the military, you're a teacher, you're an elder, a pastor at our church. Come on, stand to your feet in a second, not now, in a second. We want to honor you, but go ahead and stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Military, past and present. Hold on. Past and present. Teachers, stand to your feet. Anybody in a place of authority, police officers, listen, we love you. Thank God for you. I can't even imagine what you have to go through on a daily basis. And I understand this. Listen, there are some bad police officers, just like there's bad bankers and pastors. They got a terribly difficult job. And instead of pointing fingers, let's start praying for them and honor them. And so your church family wants to know, whatever area of leadership in your, we honor you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. We're bringing honor back to God and to one another. So I'm going to end with this. We're going to sing a song. Is it okay if we sing a song? Yes. I'm going to do a solo in just a second. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we want to end on a good note, don't we? I need some water. I was thinking this week in my office. Because I did a funeral like two months ago. Funerals, I actually like funerals better than weddings, by the way, because people are just like, they're broken and they're grieving. And man, you can just bring the gospel, their heart's wide open. And, but I, I was thinking about funerals. It's, it's the greatest place and time that we honor people. Like every, everybody dresses up and they write an obituary about the person that deceased and they say some beautiful things. And then there's a eulogy, right? And... Usually three or four family members or friends come up. And a eulogy just means to say a good thing. And the people that are going to get up and stand, they're, going to, they're, they're really thinking about what they're going to say about the person that passed away. He was just an amazing leader, husband, father, da, da, she was incredible, da, da, right? And there's a bunch of flowers up at the front and the whole hour, hour and a half, two hours. It's just to honor the person that passed away. But I just have a question. Why do we wait till somebody dies? Why do we wait till somebody dies to honor them? Why don't we start now? Why don't we start today? Why don't we start tomorrow at work? 
I think if we, if we bring honor at our workplace, everybody else is yelling at the boss, mad at the boss, cussing out the boss. But if you bring honor, I think your workplace might change. I think your school might change. I think your home might change. I think our church might change if we cultivate a spirit of honor. Anybody a con- conduit of the honor and the respect and the grace of God flowing to us and through us to other people? Would you go ahead and stand your feet? I want to pray for us and then we're going to sing a song. So before I pray, I just want, if I could just have everybody look, can you look right just in my eyes? I want to make sure that I'm connecting with you. And here, here's the two things I want to take away with today. Number one, someone say stop. stop. Say it loud. Stop, stop what? I'm here to stop cutting corners. We need to stop cutting corners in relationships, finances, on the job. We need to be people of integrity above reproach. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. We've got to stop cutting corners. Amen. Stop cutting corners with our relationship with God, stop cutting our prayer time, our devotional time, just stop cutting corners. Number two, start, someone say start. Start. We need to start honoring God, people, husbands, parents, wives, kids, coworkers. We need to honor one another. And if we do, I just believe the miracles are gonna flow to us. We need miracles in our city, in our county. We need miracles in our home, in our family, in our church. You have no idea what people in our church are going through today. I just wonder if we would just honor God and we would honor one another, what God can do in us and through us. Amen? Amen. So, Lord, we thank you. We, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We just make a declaration that we will stop cutting corners. Speak to us, God, about areas in our life that we're cutting corners in. Forgive us. We confess our sin. We've been cutting corners, and we're going to stop. Number two, God, forgive us for not honoring those people in our lives. Above us, under us, aside from us, authorities, and most importantly, help us and forgive us from, not, from dishonoring you. We welcome your presence. We welcome your goodness and your grace. We love you and thank you for speaking to us. Now, our job is to walk out of the building and put into practice what we've heard. We can only do that by your strength and your power. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together.